of the Council of Community Schools, uh, Diane Ostrowski, please call the roll. Mr. Kazire? Present. Mrs. Riley? Present. Mr. Hansen? Present. Mr. LaFerla? Present. Mr. Arthur? Present. Uh, now please join me for a moment of silence, um, and I guess a special moment of silence this week, and um, then a Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you all. Now we will have the We Are Proud of Our Schools introductions by Dr. Bruckner. Good evening, board members and our guests. I am privileged tonight to say thank you and congratulations to three groups of people. First of all, I want to say thank you to our Board of Education. Across the United States this month is a Staff Appreciation Week day or month, and we have um, appreciated our staff by giving them some coupons to go do some fun things, but we want to say thank you to you as a Board of Education. We say thank you to you every American Education Week, but we like another opportunity. So you have in front of you some note cards that display some student art, and we invite you to use those as you will. And I have for you a recognition that says, I believe in public education, and thank you to, your, to you for your service to Iowa Public Schools. And I'm gonna give each of you one and say thank you very much. Can we all say thank you to our Board of Education? And the second group of people I get to introduce are some wonderful employees that we have with us tonight. First of all, let me tell you about Amy Gustafson, who's a second grade teacher at Franklin. Amy, come on down. Let me tell you some things about Amy. She has been working in the Council of Schools since 1997. She's a second grade teacher at Franklin Elementary School, and here's what her nominators said about her. Amy is the perfect example of our district theme and vision of all our kids. As a building strategist, Amy has been active in PLC meetings to help support her teammates with Wonders implementation. Amy always makes decisions that benefit her team or the building. She started and led a couple of important initiatives this year that support our building school improvement plan. She's also an active member of the LEAD team and often leads building implementation for professional development. She always see, sees Franklin through a systems approach. Actively involved in many aspects of the school, Amy works very hard for staff and students alike. With a very positive attitude, she sets good examples every day and she stands up for what she believes. She's very knowledgeable, an amazing team player, and dedicated to all of her students, and she's very loyal. Amy is supported here tonight by Franklin Principal Kevin Brown, by husband Mark and son Luke, along with parents Rich and Nancy Johnson. Woo-hoo! Woo-hoo! <laughs> Amy, you want to say something, you know? Yeah, I do. Please do, and then I'll give you a little note card. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, first of all, but also to just kind of remind everybody here that education is only as strong as the legs that it stands on. And that means everybody in this room, from the students, to the parents, to all of you, and we need each other, and we need to support each other. So with that being said, as we all go strongly into our classrooms, my colleagues and I every day, um, fighting the good fight, I just want to 
encourage all of you to keep advocating and fighting for a strong supportive system as well, to keep really pushing for our kids to have all of the measures that they need to get the free appropriate education that they deserve, whether it's mental health, whether it is trauma-informed care, whether it is the child sitting in the classroom that really just needs that safe, calm place to learn, keep advocating and pushing and fighting for us because we need it and we appreciate it. Keep fighting those unfair and um, sometimes naive stereotypes about education being easy and about teachers in today's society. Keep advocating for us because your support means a lot. We need it. It means everything when we've had that bad day. So we need a strong system. We need each other. I think all of the people that know me and have supported me, parents, students, yes, soon to be students, some of them back there, <laughs> going to be my family. I really appreciate it. We need each other. Keep fighting the good fight. That's all I have to say. <laughs> so who knew when I said she stands up for what she believes that she was going to do it? We are so appreciative. Amy, I have for you a trophy that says License Staff Employee of the Month, and we think your gift certificate is probably at the soccer field. So I will okay. deliver that personally. <laughs> within the next okay. two days. So, okay. Amy, congratulations. Thank you very much. And now could I have Angie Brown come on down? I got the golden opportunity to call this young lady Sunday morning. And out of nowhere, here was me on the phone saying, Angie, paraeducator at Longfellow Elementary School, you are our support staff member of the month. So let me tell you about her. Angie has been working in the Council of Schools for two years. She is a preschool paraeducator at Longfellow Elementary School, and here's what her nominators said about her. Angela is a dedicated para. She comes into the classroom with a smile on her face. She's always looking to find something to be productive, and she makes sure the classroom is ready before school starts. She's calm, caring, and the quiet support that everyone needs. She sees many things before others see them, and she treats every situation with mom logic and attitude. With that, she anticipates the needs of children and assists them with their individual challenges. Angie is patient, helpful, and kind, and these characteristics are all reflected in the students with whom she works. They display the calm, logical behavior and attitude that she mentors. She has a very big heart and is so deserving of this award. Angie is supported here tonight by her husband, Mike, and three wonderful children, as well as Longfellow Principal Gary Milborn. Angie. On behalf of our school of educate our school our school board and the community education foundation i'm going to give you this trophy and i will deliver your gift card within the next two days i promise <laughs> congratulations you. you can have that for your Congratulations. And the third group of individuals I need to get to introduce to you are students tonight. Let me tell you about our 2017 State of Iowa Scholars. Four members of the class of 2017 are being honored by Iowa Governor Terry Branstead as part of the 2017 Governor's Scholar Recognition Program. This program recognizes students for consistent academic excellence during their high school careers. From Abraham Lincoln, Jacob Kaufman and Gage Weber. Jacob and Gage, come up here. You want to come introduce? Right over here? That'd be great. From Thomas Jefferson, Tucker Mass.
Now let me just tell you that Thomas Jefferson's other scholar, Tiana Latham, is at softball practice tonight. You may recall she was here last meeting to receive recognition as part of National Honor Society Volunteer Program. We are very fortunate to have three young people, such as these three gentlemen. Um, would each of you please introduce your parents or guests who are here, and then tell us where you're going to college and what you're going to do after high school. Should we take pictures? We're going to take pictures first. Tell us, Gage, tell us what you Embarrass those parents. Have, your, have, have all your relatives. You're going to tell us uh, who's here with you and where you're going to go after high school. Okay. Here with me tonight, I have my uh, dad, Chris Weber, and my grandfather, Warren Weber. I'm going to the University of Iowa to study engineering. I'm Jacob, I'm here with my parents and my brother tonight, and I am also going to Iowa, but I will be studying business. Okay. I'm Tucker, uh, I'm with my parents, Pam and Dennis, and I plan on going to the University of Oklahoma in Norman to double major in meteorology and civil engineering. Wow. Thank you very much. Martha. Martha, yes. Um, I could say for the crowd, uh, Tiana is uh, was accepted in Notre Dame, and she's going to Notre Dame for uh, like an ecological engineering. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you. So let me tell you about some other wonderful people that are here tonight. We are pleased to recognize two groups of outstanding students for robotics tonight. Council Bluffs certainly has a great reputation in this. They have represented our school district proudly as they have competed at very high levels this year. We are pleased tonight to recognize teams and members for their accomplishments. Would the students with the Woodrow Wilson Middle School team join me at the podium when I call your name? And could I be joined by Coach Denise Hogue, Principal Kim Kazmerchek? And let me have their parents stand when I introduce seventh grader Alicia Arthur. Come on up here. Denise and Kim, come on up. Congratulations. Oh, she doesn't want to. Eighth. Eighth. Kim went to the zoo with teammates. That's okay. Eighth grader Chase Koletsky. Good. And eighth grader, Brandon Witzel. The Wilson Middle School team was our first middle school team to compete at regional and national level. They first competed at the VEX IQ Regional Competition, where they earned the STEM Project of Excellence Award for their research project about companion pets for people with Alzheimer's. This included fundraising to purchase four companion pets for the Fox Run Heritage Assisted Living Community. Then, they worked very hard to earn funds to support a trip to the invitation-only VEX IQ Robotics Worlds in Kentucky in April. Coach Denise Hogue shared that the team logged more than 250 practice hours. Let's take a moment to thank their parents, coaches, and school administration for tremendous support.
And now let me recognize the members of the team from Abraham Lincoln High School, the Cinderella team. These bright and dedicated students with the support of their parents and their teachers, Ryan Higgins and Justin Heckman, participated in the VEX Robotics World Competition this year among more than 500 robots. Could you please come up? Kay Ann Bryant, who was also part of last year's team. Brendan Gear, who was also part of last year's team. Tyler Myers and Dale Feinhold. Let me tell you about them, but this is only the beginning, okay? <laughs> According to Mr. Heckman, the Lynx Robotics Program has experienced four years of incredible success, but what happened on April 22nd eclipsed all of that. He shared that the team of seniors came back from a tough start at the VEX Robotics World Championships and won their division of 96 of the best robots from all around the world. They were, there were six other divisions and they then played them with their alliance partners from China in a large arena in a round robin tournament. While they didn't win the whole thing, they came incredibly close to being world champions. And the tournament was covered by CBS for a feature to air on June 11th at 1 p.m. In addition, Mr. Heckman has been coordinating with a producer from CBS for the crew to come to AL later this week or next week to interview and film the team for another CBS sports program. So you can tell how proud we were, are of these students and their coaches and their families for their support. Congratulations. Congratulations, very much. I had the opportunity to have our new incoming superintendent at Abraham Lincoln on the day of this competition, and um, nobody in the robotics room cared that we were there because they were all watching play by play. They were very disappointed because of, a, of an early loss, but they went on to win. So wonderful, wonderful team. Thank you for letting us recognize them. And I guess I'd say great job to all the robotics teams. And um, it'd be awesome if we could find ways to keep supporting all these teams. Now we have a approval of our agenda. Is there a motion? I move approval of the agenda as presented. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. Is there a second? Second. Any changes? Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The agenda is carried. Wow. Just clears out fast. Okay, now <laughs> we have approval of our minutes for the regular meeting of April 25th. Is there a motion? I move that the minutes of the regular meeting of April 25th, 2017 be approved as presented. Thanks, Susan. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you, Dave. Is there any discussion on these or any changes anyone sees? No? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. And the approval of the minutes is carried. And now we come to the public participation portion of the meeting. Um, although the public's all left. Um, but this is an opportunity for anyone to come up and speak. Okay, and now we will jump into the superintendent's report. 
Dr. Brooker. Thank you very much, Mr. Arthur. Um, we have two reports today that um, really relate to student achievement. First of all, we have a report on a pilot that we are hoping will be available for the 2017-18 school year, and that relates to transitional kindergarten. And Julie Smith is going to lead that conversation, and I see she's ha she has her principal with her, Mr. Milborn. Um, so transitional kindergarten, or TK as we call it, actually started when Dr. Bruckner came back from a UEN meeting and um, came, with a, came with me to the idea saying, lots of our UEN counterparts are talking about transition kindergarten. Have we ever tried it here or what are we doing? So it's like, well, you know what? Let's ask the principals what they want to do and what they think. So I brought it to the elementary principals, and we had three principals at that time interested in, in pursuing the idea of it and looking at it further. And they went back and talked to their teams and um, really came at the end that Longfellow was really wanting to pursue. They had a viable team that wanted to work on it and pursue that. And I'm going to let Gary talk about everything that we did from there. So I just want to let you know how it started. All right. Um, so I'm going to walk you through. Um, how we articulated our why, what the TK or Transitional Kindergarten Program is, um, how we created it, and then some next steps. So we really started with um, why should a TK program exist at Longfellow? And, and you can see there, um, we decided that it should really be an experience or a program um, that promotes self-confidence and independence in our children while serving as a bridge between preschool and kindergarten. We have uh, many students that come to us with very late birthdays. Um, they, they just barely make that kindergarten cutoff, and, and their parents come to us, and even our teachers come to us sometimes and say, boy, I don't know if our kids are ready for kindergarten. The, the, um, their social emotional needs are, are just not quite um, with their peers. So that was one of the, um, really one of the main reasons we were looking at this. Um, another one is we see at the beginning of the year we are, we're asking these kids who um, some, they've never been in a preschool program. And then we've put them in a kindergarten and said conform to our kindergarten expectations and our academic press and our rigor. And, and sometimes those kids just need more time to learn how to share, how to um, cooperate in a group, how to line up, how to hold their lunch tray. Um, and so there's a lot of, there's many experiences there where maybe kids aren't quite ready. In uh, many of the communities around um, the metro area um, do offer a program like this, so we wanted to go back and see, could we do something at Longfellow? So what is it, what could it look like at Longfellow? And I say, what could it look like? Um, because we're not sure yet if we will be implementing it next year because we need to build a program with, with enough kids. So we're still in the recruitment process. Um, <clears throat> but if we were able to um, build a program, this is what it would look like. It would be an intentional two-year program. And in year one, um, it would be a, a large focus on the social emotional skills of those students. And then it would be a focus on emergent literacy skills. So we would really take the kindergarten curriculum that's required by the state, that's stated in the Common Core, and really just slow it down. So instead of moving boom, boom, boom throughout the year, we would spread out those benchmarks, those expectations, and ki give kids much longer um, to master those skills. After year one, we would transition kids back into kindergarten as we know it, and they would get the <coughs> Common Core, and the primary focus would be growing and mastering all those curriculum areas. The big idea here, after looking at some FAST data, after looking at um, many different um, behavioral points, would be can we have kids really ready to read and succeed in first grade after, two, after a two-year program? And we were very confident that we could do that. Uh, the program would actually look like um, just one teacher, a uh, paraprofessional, and then um, we were trying to keep the class size at 10 to 15 kids. 
Would you see the, the teacher following those students then between year one and year two? Good question. We, um, and that's a good transition into our how. We discussed that as a team, and we had um, quite a bit of discussion about that. So that concept of looping with those kids um, was definitely presented. Um, at that time, our team decided that we would rather not loop um, and, and so we will disperse those kids mm -hmm. back in with the three other teachers. Um, and probably the decision making, um, the thought behind that was um, we would, we kind of foresee this to be a pretty intense, um, intense endeavor because you're, you're um, going to be working with kids with a lot of a social emotional, they need a lot of growth in those areas. So it's going to be um, pretty intensive, and so following those kids um, every year might not might not make as much sense. So, sure. yep. And so that gets us back to the to the how we really took. The, I really took this to our team and said, "Is this something we want to do?" Um, because it entails one teacher taking a group of kids for transitional kindergarten, and the rest of the team having a little bit of a larger class size, and them agreeing, "Yes, we'll take a larger class size because you're taking." Um, this group of kids with targeted, um, targeted instruction. And so uh, you can't do that with one person on board. You can't do that with two people on board. We had to have all four people on board to, to do that. After we agreed to that, we determined some criteria. We looked at other programs um, around the state and said, how are we go going to figure out how kids fit in this program? How are we going to help parents decide and make this decision? So we looked at some screeners, we looked at some uh, preschool data, we looked at many different um, kind of tools out there, and we created a screener um, that parents can fill out, and it gives them a score, and the scores basically said, if your child falls in this range, consider TK. If your child falls in this range, TK would be a really good idea, and if your child falls in this range, kindergarten's probably the best fit. So that's not the, that doesn't make or break the decision, but it, it's a tool to help parents and um, to help us open the conversation with them and, and maybe guide them when they're coming to us and saying, I'm not sure, should they go to kindergarten? I don't know if they're ready. So the last piece um, would be recruitment. We talked about that at um, Kindergarten Roundup. So we presented the idea at Kindergarten Roundup. We had, um, 41 um, students enroll at Kindergarten Roundup. So we had five or six parents uh, inquire about transitional kindergarten. Right now we have um, three students on board for it. Um, so the next phase is to get out there and kind of promote it and recruit it. We do something at Longfellow called a sneak peek and um, our teachers come in one day in the summer and the parents sign up at Kindergarten Roundup and they get to spend 30 minutes to 45 minutes with the kindergarten teacher and they play games and while they're playing games, um, we talk to the parents about the academics. And through that process, um, we believe we might be able to identify some more kids that could potentially fit in the program. And then <clears throat> we typically have um, anywhere from 80 to 85 kindergartners at Longfellow. So that means most likely 40 or 45 kindergartners will show up at our door on back to school nights or during the first week of school next year. And so um, we've talked about having maybe a three week flex period um, with those students that just show up where we can observe them, work with them, talk with the parents and then decide um, whether any of those kids would fit in the program. So if we get the numbers, we will move. So that is, um, and Julie's going to talk about some next steps. Other than that, any other questions for me? Or I have a question about. Sure. Um, so, are these typically children who have not had any preschool prior to this? Uh, it really depends on which um, which community you want to examine. Are you okay? Um, in some of the smaller communities <coughs> around um, Iowa. A lot of times, um, parents call it we're red shirting our kids or we're doing that. Uh, 
Um, so it's very, it's a very common practice in, the, in those communities. But, so it just depends. Right now we're working with the information we have. And so I have a lot of information in my hand about preschool students, how they're progressing on the gold, um, their birth dates and things like that. So um, the three students we are looking at currently all have had preschool. But those 40 to 45 that will probably sh show up in August, mm -hmm. I would imagine uh, many of them will not have had preschool, and, and that'll be a, a really big determining factor. Do we have any data from the other communities that have instituted this program regarding correlation to transitional kindergarten and high school graduation rates? I do not have any at this time. I can say that the super to answer your question, Scott, no. Nobody has necessarily followed a group that closely. But um, so many of the superintendents at the meeting talked about this really meets the need of the child that is old enough to be in kindergarten but just isn't quite ready for kindergarten. And, and the agreement in the room is that it absolutely is a good thing for those individual children. And it is condoned and um, paid for by the state. The state supports these kids in two years of preschool. so. I mean, of kindergarten. So it, there is a sense that it's um, effective, but I don't think there's that evidence that you're looking for. We can track it if we want to. Okay. How is, it, is the feedback from parents on like the kindergarten program? I, and I assume that parents that are coming in and enrolling the 40 students that might roll, enroll later on in the summer, do you anticipate that parents may be less likely to participate in the program or? Um, I don't know if I have enough information really to, to answer that. Uh, like I said, we had five or six people ask about it out of the 40 that came to back to school night <clears throat> and we had three sign up. So I think um, three were, were like, oh, so it's basically, there, was, there were questions like, well, if they're, if they're progressing, can they move out of the program? Mm -hmm. um, and there were questions like, so does that mean they, you know, they were doing the math in their heads, does that mean they graduate when they're this age? Um, so I, I don't know if it's as socially, and I'm just talking right. off the cuff here, Stay I don't know if it's as socially acceptable mm -hmm. as it is sure. in maybe some of the smaller surrounding towns that call it red shirting. And mm -hmm. a lot of communities kind of take pride in you know, they're going to be bigger when they play sports. They're going to be more mature when they go to college. They're going to, you right. know, they kind of look at it long term like that. I'm not sure if we have that um, kind of social norm yet, but yeah. we'll find out. How do we create that culture to decrease the stigmata of negativity to say this is perfectly appropriate? I mean, my daughter's an August baby, and she wasn't ready to start when she was five. So I thought this would have been great for her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we absolutely have kids that are that are August birthdays that yeah. are ready, and we absolutely have the kids, and that's why we come back to that that strong why statement is we just want to provide a bridge for for those kids and families that aren't ready. Do you think it's the name that's the stigmata transitional kindergarten, or um, I don't know to be honest. Just the thought of them going another year than yeah, somebody I, else, and I think part of it for us is it's new here. Yeah, you know, it, it, it it's hasn't a new had concept. time to build a good reputation. It yeah. hasn't had time to show some of the advantages that we can actually talk about in our community and have people say, oh yeah, it was great for my kid. It's just brand new. So it's just, I think part of it's gonna take us some time yeah. to build that up. Um, which and kind I think of you did that with preschool too, right? I mean, it just took time for Absolutely. people to <laughs> grasp on the concept <laughs> of preschool and now it's um, accepted socially. So. I guess, <laughs> how would this change our preschool partners and instruction and it wouldn't really change anything with preschool other than um, maybe when we look at some identification for kids who might be good candidates for TK because um, in transition kindergarten you have to meet the age, uh, age eligibility for kindergarten and once you do that you're no longer eligible for preschool. So this really fills that um, spot even with some of our preschoolers that they thought, oh boy, if we would have had just one more year of preschool, right. you know, and so this is, as Gary mentioned, that bridge between the two, not only for kids who haven't had preschool, but also maybe kids who struggled in preschool and might need that extra oh, year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our next steps. I, um, I just had 
Oh, I'm last, sorry. One last question. The, the three students who have signed up, uh, did the parents use the screening tool to help uh, in that decision to, to sign those students up for, for the TK? Yes. Good. Yes, Good. they did. Um, so uh, all six that inquired used the screening tool, and then the other three made the decision based on that in a conversation with me and, and the teachers. Sure. Well, Good. Thanks. Do a question on that. If we were unable to get the other students in the necessary, what supports do we try to provide these students who we feel need this additional instruction in, in a regular classroom or a regular time frame? Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to go back to our traditional model of um, four teachers really differentiating their classrooms and differentiating supports um, for these kids versus one teacher differentiating a whole program. So um, it would be the same model of support that we're right. using right now. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. yeah. you could see the give and take though with the team of yeah I'll have a little bit class a larger class size because my my range of differentiation won't be as as big as the other teachers and we can see the growth that we can see in that one teacher. Will the will the uh, TK uh, is teacher then have? Uh, need additional professional development to to help support those students that that need those additional that additional care and and uh, uh, um, help. Absolutely, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, we have a very skilled teacher um, with a very strong early childhood background, so um, we believe that we can hit the ground running per se, um, but she will definitely need some supports and professional development um, along the way as well. Sure. And, and Julie and I have been talking about how we can do that as well. So our next steps, um, Mr. Hansen and you had mentioned talk about the monitoring. And so one of the things we really want to look at is at the end of two years, how are our kids who go through TK, um, how are they ready for kindergarten or first grade, excuse me, are we meeting that goal of those of the kids in that classroom being really ready, strong first grade students going in who won't need a lot of intervention or support after that, that they'll truly be ready and at grade level. That will be one um, indicator of our success. And then um, as we see that working to again expand this option um, to other schools who are interested as, as you listen to Gary talk about the team involvement needed and the team commitment needed and the structure of or the, the makeup of your kindergarten teachers, it's really something you have to sit and consider as a team as well as uh, your population and where else that go, but we would definitely want to expand to other schools as they are ready to take this on. So, so. I have another question. Um, would this be something that if someone, you know, someone's going to another school and saw this program, um, another Council Bluff school and saw this program, could enroll them in Longfellow? We had talked about that, and at this time we are saying, we, we are thinking not, because it starts to skew the numbers that are there. Um, for every child that you would take in from another school, the other kindergarten classes at, at Longfellow would get bigger and bigger because they're, they're not drawing from their same pool. So at this time we thought we would see, can we just run it at that school? We're okay. thinking not. Well, I hope you're able to fill, fill the, the program so we can hear some updates next year. It sounds like it's a great need for our community. So, Thank you. Very good, thank you. I, I've got a question for Dr. Bruckner, I guess. Then how, how uh, do we uh, get to count the student then? Uh, is that student then a uh, one FTE uh, or, or are we back to that uh, half a, uh, point 0.5 FTE. The student uh, is a one FTE both years. There we go. We kind of cross that bridge first. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. But I want to say thank you to Gary and to Julie and to the other principals because um, in the midst of all of the other good work they're doing, they were willing to consider something new and they did a lot of work on it. And so I do hope that it goes because everyone that was involved said it's a really good program and I think if we do get it off the ground, it will go off the ground in some other places. So thank you very much for your willingness, so, Gary. So they're a one FTE because of the way we've identified they're, they're how they fit? Kids. They're kindergarten. Well, that's and true. They're kindergarten. Even they're though they, school. because they're age qualified. That's right. Okay. okay. Yeah. okay. Yep. So we're not gonna have under.
said that, that was <laughs> that would not sell if we were telling you half, half and half. half, and half. Yeah. 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 Mm. Dr. So Workman, welcome. Good evening. Good evening. It's my privilege tonight to share with you some information about uh, some updates to our personal health and wellness curriculum. Um, and tonight I would like to share with you, uh, in addition to the information I prepared for you in your board packet, uh, more specifically, I uh, would like to visit with you about the purpose behind the work um, that was com recently completed, uh, the process that was used to complete that work, and then the products that were completed as a result of the team's effort. So first of all, I want to start with the why, uh, the purpose behind uh, why we undertook the endeavor to update the personal health and wellness curriculum. And this actually encompassed an update to both physical um, education, science, and health at different grade levels. Um, and one of the reasons we did that was to continue um, our work on curriculum updates. As you well know, uh, we had a curriculum management audit um, a couple of years ago, and one of the deficiencies that they noticed um, and that we were forthright in letting them know about is that we had not done an adequate job of preparing um, for a comprehensive health curriculum. That was one of the things that we wanted to tackle. We also want to continue to meet the requirements of state code um, related to personal health and wellness. And even more importantly than that, uh, we believe it's important to provide students with accurate, fact-based, and age-appropriate uh, information related to personal health and wellness so that kids can make good, informed decisions and make good, healthy choices in their lives as students and as adults. Um, and then lastly, uh, we wanted to uh, address some of the data that we shared with you in your board packet um, about issues that we're facing um, in, uh, in childhood, um, where, whether it's obesity or decisions that students are making um, once they leave uh, school. So the process we used for this um, was similar to uh, the traditional curriculum revision process that we've used in the past. Um, but what was nice about this is we could not have done this work without the extraordinary leadership of our teacher leaders. Um, and so I want to introduce to you tonight three uh, individuals who led this effort um, starting way back in September. Um, Karen McVeigh, who is our science curriculum specialist in K-12. Brant Anderson, who leads physical education in um, K-12. through And then Heidi Clement, who you heard from a couple of months ago, um, who is our team pregnancy coordinator. Um, and through the uh, integrated action of these three individuals, along with individual teacher teams, um, all the way from grades K through 12, they developed a uh, comprehensive personal health and wellness curriculum uh, that was included in your board packet. The other thing I want to note about the process that we use is that all of our curriculum materials um, are standards based. Um, just like if we were rewriting an English language arts curriculum or a math curriculum, we would look to the national standards and try to identify what we believe are the most important things that kids need to master based on the uh, research and the expertise of our teachers. The product that they produced I'm very proud of. Um, it was included in your board packet, um, but I just want to give you the highlights of some of the topics that will be covered um, as students progress K through 12. Um, students will start in kindergarten. Uh, they'll focus on physical activity, individual and family health, and community and social health. Um, in first grade, they'll have access to personal health, drugs, alcohol, and tobacco abuse, and nutrition. And in second grade, mental and emotional health, anatomy, and injury prevention and safety. Then you will see these themes start to spiral back for students. In third grade, students will be, uh, again, exposed to uh, information about physical activity, individual, family, and social, community, and social health. Fourth grade, anatomy, mental and, and emotional health, injury prevention and safety. And then in, fi in fifth grade, nutrition, personal health and reproduction, drugs, alcohol, and tobacco abuse. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are complete rewrites um, where we included a robust personal health component into physical education. Um, and they will focus at sixth grade on physical activity, the importance of individual and family health, community and social health, at seventh grade on the importance of nutrition, drugs, alcohol and tobacco abuse, and, and personal health, and at eighth grade, conflict resolution, mental and emotional health, and injury and prevention and safety. The personal health at ninth grade 
um, will be a trimester long class that will take the place of intro to PE. Um, we'll have a physical education component and a personal health and wellness component as well. And we'll focus on many of the same topics that were, uh, have been introduced and spiraled from K through uh, grade eight. In addition, students will have um, CPR training as required by the state of Iowa. So those are the three big areas in which we um, conducted work this year on personal health and wellness. Um, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone have questions? I guess I did have one question myself. Sure. Um, and maybe I'm just reading into the kind of the learning thoughts, I guess, that are in there about uh, personal health. Mm -hmm. And there was several times that um, uh, head lice was mentioned around third grade, and then I think even fourth grade, and the others in different steps in there. Um, is that something that we're currently not, I don't think we're sending out notices anymore when there's occurrences in classrooms. I just have not seen that. I could not answer that, but. Like, I'm just, it's weird that that's part I, of it. I know that some schools do. I received one about two weeks ago. So it's. <laughs> but um, <laughs> as a parent of a first grader, but I, I, I am sure that's our policy. I, I know received Mr. Them too. Hamilton could check Okay, into so that's that. more class to class or teacher. You might just have a lucky streak here. No, well, <laughs> I would say not, but I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, well, yeah. I, would, I would mention that one of the key components of a guaranteed and viable curriculum is that we provide a universal support for all students, which, as you well noticed in your preview of yeah. the materials, um, one of the things we want kids to have access to is accurate, fact-based, and age-appropriate information right. about how the choices that they make impact their personal health. Um, and right. so sometimes we try to do a good job of helping students understand the situations that they're in and how they can be an active participant in helping themselves. Well, I, you know, having seen kind of some of the debacles that have come out of the national kind of health standards and sure. different names, um, are there places that parents can go to to get accurate great information question. about? It's a great question, Troy. Yes. Um, we have already started to, one of the next steps that our teams will be working on next year is identifying the resources that will help teachers feel adequately prepared and that will provide access to students and parents and families about how this will be implemented in Council of Schools. And we will use information that is from government reliable sources such as the Centers for Disease Control, Health and Human Services, all that have been vetted by the Iowa Department of Education and the information that we have through a generous grant from Children's Hospital through healthteacher.com will form the underlying foundation of our curriculum. Very good. There will not be any, uh, any information provided to students, teachers, or parents that is not fact-based and grounded in research that comes from credible organizations that are either government-funded um, that have no agendas. Well, I almost think sometimes just to let people know that this is not some foreign curriculum. Nope. This is our curriculum. That's right. That we've developed, we've developed in partnership with our with teacher the teams. That's yeah. right, based on national standards. Absolutely correct. Yes. And Cor Corey mentioned this, but it is so obvious right here by looking at these three people yep. that this was not, um, for instance, an English curriculum written by English teachers or a science curriculum written by science teachers. This was an absolutely collaborative um, process that went across departments and um, really led to, to something that we are very proud of and, and has the buy-in of, of these people and their colleagues. So um, it's really the right way to do curriculum development and the outcome is so beneficial because we had lots of voices in the room talking about what kids need and when they need it. So I applaud you for your leadership and I applaud you, Corey, for setting up a team that really was gonna make a difference. Well, and I think just stating that, uh, that these, these people who are currently actively dealing with and teaching our sure. kids and, and seeing what's actually happening to our students yep. as opposed to sometimes what mom and dad think is happening to our students. That's right. right. Um, so thank you all. Thank you.
And you didn't have to talk. Okay, so now we have Diane Ostrowski, former secretary, is now going to come. Yeah, that's okay. And speak we'll on have the a good conversation without the benefit of an in house audience. That's right. For people at home, legislative summary Diane Ostrowski, two <laughs> roles. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you for everything that you did this legislative session to make sure our voice was heard in Des Moines and among our legislators who represent us. I want to personally uh, point out that we have a very strong leader and a strong voice in Des Moines and Dr. Bruckner, having you know formed relationships with our legislators, other key education leaders at the S Senate and House, and also serving on task, force, task forces that we're making important decisions and recommendations to the state. So we're going to miss that. Maybe she'll stay at active as an advocate in the coming session. <laughs> I provided to you the preliminary summary and some highlights of the session that were provided by the, um, uh, during a, U, uh, a, a meeting of our uh, AEA superintendents and then also from the Iowa Association of School Boards. We anticipate they'll give final summaries for us and we'll make sure you all get those. But I just thought I'd pull a, pull a few of them that were um, were instrumental, I think, in this, this session. The state supplemental aid, as you know, was set early on and it was established for this year, um, for this coming year, I should say, at 1.11, which allowed us to make some decisions on the budget based on what our funding will be. The collective bargaining, as you know, uh, was a major piece of legislation, changed the way we uh, are doing business, changed and prompted us to do some real collaboration with our, with our teachers and our um, associations so that we could show our support and our efforts to make sure that they felt supported in their work here in the district, and we're going to continue to do that. The categorical categorical flexibility. So two different bills gave us more flexibility in how we use those funds. And um, that, according to, to Dean, will really help us uh, increase uh, our options and allow us to use the money in ways that are important for us in our community that we might not have been able to use otherwise. And the home rule, I think you all uh, perhaps have insight into this, but it in allows us to specifically do things that are not uh, outlined in law. Whereas before, we were governed by what's called Dillon's Law, and that said we couldn't do it if it wasn't specifically stated in law. So it's a kind of a change in our paradigm, and really don't know the impact of this, but it's, it's a guide for us moving forward. The repeal of the third grade retention law, uh, that really, I think, uh, was born out of the the necessity of lack of funding, um, but I think we are supportive of the fact that the legislature still feels that having students at the end of third grade being proficient at their grade level is important. We certainly believe that and strive toward that, but that holding children back or providing, requiring them to do a summer learning experience was costly and potentially harmful, especially for a student who's um, who, to be held back. So. I think there's some positive of this. It shows that they're willing as a governing body to change the way they feel about something or change the, the approach to something that's important, but maybe that wasn't the right way to go about it. Darn it, no action on the statewide sales tax. No bucket list item completed on that, Dr. Bruckner. Um, I think the voice from our community and many others was loud and clear. I appreciated the fact that the Iowa Association of School Boards created videos about three different communities who've used it very effectively. I think everyone in our community agrees that. I think our legislators support that, but it just didn't have the legs this year. Um, we're not going to drop it, I don't think. At least I wouldn't anticipate that you would as a board as a good strategy. Statewide assessment. Um, it took us back a few steps, but it did um, It at least allows a new kind of pathway for the um, Iowa Department of Education to take a look and find a new assessment tool. At least it helped us to know what our assessment tool was going to be for the coming year instead of being kind of in waiting. 
our next steps. Um, obviously, um, having voices at the State House that are not superintendents and even school board members, those of parents and other community members who are impacted by a, a very uh, well-supported education system, um, uh, having their voices at the State House is really, really important. So I think we'll continue to set a goal to recruit as many who are interested as possible, make sure we inform them, um, kind of empower them to be voices at, uh, on important education issues. Continue to strive to do that. And we would typically request of you in July a conversation and uh, approval of some uh, priority areas for the Iowa Association of School Boards to take to their legislative group and, and confirm as we enter the 2018 session. What kind of conversation would you like to have this evening or what questions might I try to answer in it with Dr. Bruckner's support? I guess I do have a question on um, on this home rule issue. So this limited ability to make decisions were not expressly prohibited. Um, is that something that the UEN is going to be leading kind of maybe where that might benefit districts or who's going to be, are districts just going to kind of flounder in the gray areas? Oh, nobody's What's going to happen, <laughs> I guess? Um, the conversation that I heard, which was really interesting, is that, um, and I don't know that anybody's put any wording to this yet, but that there are times that the Department of Education hands out um, guidance. And we assume we're supposed to follow the guidance. And with Home Rule, we can decide not to follow the guidance if we think we don't need to follow the guidance. Now, there's certain rules we have to follow. We have to follow statute, et cetera. But that was one of the ways. So if we wanted to do some sort of an alternate organization of how we do some planning or we present some curriculum or we organize school groups, we could do that. The one that comes to mind easiest, the biggest fight was in Waterloo where you say about eight years ago had uniforms yeah. and they were told they couldn't have uniforms because it, it wasn't in Dylan's rule right. and they objected to that and got permission to do uniforms. But now we wouldn't have to have a court case or get permission. So I think, um, you know, I hope the word isn't flounder, but I'm certain that school districts will find more and more ways to help us use this to get to where we need to be. At the same time, um, and Diane didn't include it up there, but um, we are somewhat concerned about uh, a push next year for ESAs, educational savings accounts, because um, the schools that would benefit from educational savings accounts do not have to follow the same rules in a whole bunch of areas. And so if we can use some creative planning to help our students succeed, um, it kind of it doesn't level the playing field at all, but it gives us some ability to start thinking creatively. And I'm guessing the longer that that's there, the more creative school districts will become. Do you think there's, I mean, is there moves afoot to say, okay, as long as we're following law and meeting core <coughs> instruction requirements, let's be kind of liberal and almost in what we're trying to do to try to service our community the best way we can? I think that's where it will lead. I don't know that there's moves out there yet. Um, people talked about home rule and Dylan's rule for a long time as though it was something that would never change and, and under the previous legislative um, makeup, it had no chance of changing and this time it changed. So I think the jury's gonna be out on how we use it. Hopefully we will be smart enough to use it to help us do good things for kids. So if it's not expressly stated in code, guidance from the Department of Ed is a suggestion? It's guidance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. it's I, I guess I was al always under the impression that the guidance from the Department of Ed was the way that they measured whether or not you were compliant with the code. I think it's their interpretation though. Um, we were kind of told that the Department of Education was not in favor of this, so I think it's- That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we can't, 
violently uh, break rules, but we can now, and I think we will learn more and more ways to be creative. Not mm -hmm. uh, push back is one way of saying it, but be creative in how we do some things without being fearful that somebody's going to come down and tell you that you did it wrong. So an analogy would be, now we can be the teacher that holds class outside instead of in the classroom on the sunny day. That might be true. Ooh. Yeah. So. Mm. so, school districts and school boards can certainly make rules through policy and regulation. So it's definitely not a free-for-all, but I think, I, I, you know, it's early. The session just closed. Um, there's some good things that happen, there's some bad things that happen, but interestingly enough, on the good news side, there was some legislation that said all school districts have to have some sort of courses K-12 related to computer science. Um, we think we're far ahead of that, but that's okay. It wouldn't have been the top thing I would have thought about pushing this year if I were asked. By the way, I was asked, and I said, that's not the first <laughs> thing I'd push. Um, but the, the, led, the Department of Ed has already set up the task forces that's, that's going to study that. And we are fortunate to have Denise Krohn, Denise Hogue, who was here tonight, um, has been put on that committee. So we will have wonderful representation on that committee. We love that. I almost said, but don't worry about it, because in two years, the legislature may totally throw out what you've worked on for months and months, but maybe that won't be true. <laughs> so, um, the, it's easier for the Department of Ed to do things like set up a study committee than to figure out exactly how home rule is going to look. So it'll be it'll be very very interesting to watch and to live through. Um, and then, actually, a question on the third grade: How does this impact what we were going to do? to try to make sure our kids we, are proficient in where they should be. We, it's not the wrong thing to do. No, we have the gift of Iowa West Foundation, which um, very few other districts have anything like that. And Iowa West Foundation has supported our summer programming long before the state started in with their rule on third grade retention. We argued, as did most educators, argued against the idea of retention. We did never, ever argue against the idea that kids should read by third grade. But Iowa West has supported us, and Corey has helped a team design the most exciting summer program ever this year with leadership ahead of time, as he talked earlier, um, with support from Deborah Reed, who last year did things across the state, but since this law just went away, She's eager to help districts that want to do the right thing, and so she is working with us to figure out what the evaluation system is, to try to give us some measures that we can actually measure before and after. Um, they're do it is so wonderful. They're doing tests already of anybody that's going to summer school, and then they're going to test them in the fall to see how well they did. Um, they've got middle school rearranged. That's not for third grade reading, but middle school rearranged into two three-week camps. It is glorious, and it has, we talked today at Cabinet, it has gotten us closer to um, year-round school, which was a really bad word when sometime we suggested it a while ago. It's gotten us to year-round support for kids who need year-round support. Not for everybody, but for kids who need year-round support, they can get it. With a seven-week elementary program, um, uh, a high school program that gets kids to graduation, hopefully some additional kids by June 30th, it's just wonderful. So we're continuing in exactly the same way we would have with more support, but that's because we have the gift of Iowa West Foundation. And unfortunately, many school districts across the state of Iowa don't have anything close to that. I'm almost thinking that you'll have, a, you'll have districts where there are, really are some struggling learners who now won't get the focus they need because they got weak on this, I'm just setting this requirement. But it would be safe to say that we're moving forward as if it were still in place, but we don't have the 
negative effect of of uh, retaining our students that that we know educationally is wrong so. the other thing this summer I mean it's just it is glorious the whole 21st century grants have allowed us to do some things with all of our kids in summer summer programming this year that are going to turn those kids on to education and build our collaboration with families it's it's really really good so I know somebody used to say our job in Council Bluff Schools is to render the state and federal government irrelevant. Gee, I wonder who that was. Yes, <laughs> and we have done that through our summer programming. And so when the state government says, okay, never mind, you don't have to do that, we're so far ahead of them, we don't even pay attention to that. Great example. Glad that happened this month. I'm going to get a little sentimental for the next two meetings. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I do have a question on any of these bills that are passed, not signed, that we think will definitely get signed or ones that won't be signed or I'm just curious because there's quite a few out there. Uh, at the Green Hills AEA meeting, uh, Rorkhorn from SAI said that there's, there's no anticipation right now that bills won't be signed. Okay. So. It's, not, I mean, like we all remember when the governor vetoed the extra 2% on July 3rd mm -hmm. after the f fiscal year had already begun, but there, there's no sense that they're not signed because um, he doesn't support them. He's just kind of been busy traveling. Okay. All right. What are the main reasons why the SAVE bill <laughs> didn't pass? I mean, what's the... Two things, I think. First of all, um, it didn't, for what we discussed at the superintendent's meeting, is it's still, while we need it right now, because it's 12 years out, while we need it right now, legislators see it as 12 years out. Oh, you know, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. But in the meantime, we can't do the, the bonding that we need to do. But for them, 12 years out seems like forever. The other thing that I suspect for all sorts of very legitimate reasons is that the governor and his staff are miffed that nobody jumped on the combined water quality save bill. And so I was in a room twice when the lieutenant governor was asked twice if there was any support from the governor's office for passing save, extending save, and the answer was we proposed a, an extension last year that did not get support, and we don't have a, an, a proposal this year. Now, to me, that sounds like we're a little mad that you didn't support it, and so we're not going to be out there banging the drum to make it pass. I, I did have a question. I was looking through the AEA notes in there about the probationary period for new administrators. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for a district like ours that there is that a, like a hey you're on probation you'd be terminated at will mm -hmm. what's kind of the yeah toby there i noticed that yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> we'll have our probationary administrator come up and talk about that <laughs> yes so and and it would apply to our new superintendent mm -hmm. um myself i'm in that boat but like mr hamilton who is in his second year he doesn't have his extended to a third year because so he kind of misses that cut up so he doesn't need to sweat bullets anymore. But um, yeah, so any, and, you, and it used to be that if there was a probationary period for an administrator, the board could waive that and you no longer have the option to do that, mm -hmm. unfortunately, is the way it used to be. Um, we all have three year probationary periods for administrators as well as our teachers as well. Do you think there, will there be more, will this just drive greater administrator movement? I mean, what is the, is the point to, like I, I don't. I, I don't know what the point is. In all honesty, I don't. I think we know our teachers and our administrators pretty well after two years. There's also a provision that you can tell an administrator by May 15 that they have one year, one year contract next year. Um, none of that is necessarily helpful. Maybe that is the administrative side of cutting collective bargaining. I mean, maybe that's where. Um, I don't. I don't know. I didn't understand some of the changes to the rules to collective bargaining either, but. There's a little bit of thought process 
um, potentially that if you have an administrator that maybe isn't your strongest administrator, but you don't want to maybe go through the whole termination process, but if you tell them, for example, that if they have a year left, it's more of like we would coach out somebody else, kind of an option for you that for an administrator. Like I think that that one year non-renewable contract is other states have that. Like I've seen that. I would okay. assume so. And even if you move within Iowa, you start your probationary pro uh, period over again. So if uh, um, we introduced at the SAI meeting, at the Green Hills meeting, new superintendents, and they're all going to be on probationary contracts for three years. But teachers are a little different under the probationary period, which is anything with that same, just to show you the difference in the two. A teacher that's on probation, it's three years for a new teacher, but if they've already completed a probationary period in another district, even though they're new to our district, they only have to be on probation with us for one year. So it's a little different for teachers versus how they've changed for administrators. Thank you. You mentioned that you expect ESAs to come up again next year. Are there any other um, discussions or bills that you expect to come up in committee next year? Um, school administrators of Iowa talked about SA, um, ESAs will most likely come up. Um, they were the ones, Diane and I talked about this, that said when our legislators see me coming or see some of you coming, it's like, oh yeah, here comes Martha again. <laughs> have lost, lost the push. What, they, what we need are um, parents that are doing that speaking, that are not school employees and are not school board members. And they said that every single day at the legislature, that the legislature is in session, there are representatives from um, private schools and representatives from home schools. And they are there every day. And um, the point was made, 93% of children come from public schools, and yet we in public schools don't have someone there every day. And that our voices, we all get excited when the bill's coming up, but in the meantime, other people have been there the whole time. Um, they believe that one of the first things that we should do next year is push for save. I mean, maybe as we get closer to that 2029 uh, sunset, we can light a fire under some administrators. If you've, you've been to the, the local coffees, every one of our legislators across the board said they were in support of it. They just haven't had enough support or haven't made it a priority that they've gone out and gotten other people. I think well, they the made, assessment they made fights a, are they, over. They made a priority on making their jobs easier when they passed the state supplemental aid bill. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. So now they have to did make that decision within 30 days of the governor's budget, but only for the next year. And they don't even have to think about the year after that. We're going to make lemonade. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Diane. You're welcome. <laughs> it's a bad lemonade. <laughs> And now for everyone at home, we come to the resolution portion of the meeting. And our first resolution is approval of new job descriptions. Is there a motion? I move to approve the newly created job description for the coordinator of, oops, uh, yeah, that, that's yep. it. For the coordinator of preschool programming and for student and family advocate as presented. Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? Second. Susan, is there any discussion on these new job descriptions? All right, Diane, please call the roll. Sure, Mr. Kozire? Yes. Mrs. Riley? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Dr. Agres? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. And the motion is carried. Now we have approval of a revised job description. Is there a motion? I move to approve the revision of the to the library and media clerk job description as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you, Chris. Um, is there any discussion on this? Uh, I know early on we received some interesting uh, commentary on this library and media clerk. Uh, this is the clerk position, which is a little different than well, that original. Just that whole media yeah. thing was interesting. 
All right, there's no discussion. Uh, Diane? Mrs. Riley? Yes. Mr. LaPerla? Yes. Mr. Kosire? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Dr. Algras? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. The motion is carried. And now we have up for us a resolution to approve Polk County Technological Cooperative, or Technology Cooperative for the 17 18 school year. Is there a motion? I'll move to approve the 28E Polk County Technology Cooperative Agreement with Area Education 11 for Software Support Services and direct the board president to set, sign said contract for the 2017-18 school year. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Excellent. Is there any discussion on this? Nice to know we're saving money. This is a, an ongoing contract with a new name, but this was our work with an AEA to um, help us with SunGuard and other systems. Excellent. There's no discussion, Diane? Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Kozire? Yes. Dr. Agres? Yes. Mrs. Riley? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes, and the motion is carried. And now we have uh, approval of policy reviews. Our first reading of the following policies. 510 use of electronic surveillance and security equipment for students, 601 school day, 606 physical education exception, 617 internet appropriate student use, 628 teaching about controversial issues, 633 student publications, 634 student qualifications for senior year plus coursework, 712 post issuance compliance for tax exempt obligations, and 801 for property management. Is there a motion? I'll move to approve the first reading of the aforementioned policies as presented. Thank you, sir. Second. Excellent. Thank you, ma'am. Is there any discussion on these first reading of these policies? I did think the property management one was interesting. And should it even be titled that way? Since we took out property management out of it. Okay. We can go back and look at that. It just didn't make sense. Um, there was um, one of them I know had some things we could change on the wording if we wanted to, like it was, um, I could, um, it, it removed a, I have to find it, it just removed something so the wording kind of didn't make as much sense, content, so maybe the point wasn't there, but, um, okay, I'll try to find it. Right, well, actually, it's, I believe it's in the property management. As I'm looking at this, the district will maintain a for record of all real and personal property of the district. So I'm thinking that yeah, maybe we so. wanted to remove the word for as well because we removed the three words before that. Yeah. To read the district will maintain a record of all real and personal property of the district. And move the word to. And and remove the word too, and facilitate efficient and effective use of these assets. Okay. Um, if there's no other change of discussion, um, Diane, please call the roll. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Dr. Agres? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mrs. Riley? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes, and the motion to approve the first reading of the policies is passed. Now we come to our consent agenda, uh, which includes personnel action and claims and accounts. Is there a motion? I move approval of the consent agenda. Thank you, Scott. Is there a second? Second. Excellent. There's no discussion. Diane, please call the roll. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mrs. Riley? Yes. Dr. Agres? Yes. Mr. Kozire? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes, and the motion is carried. And with that, we are adjourned.